All right, we're here with Jim Davidson, um, and Jim Jim has an amazing story that we're excited to share with everybody. Jim, thanks a lot for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Great to be here. And you've uh, you've done some amazing climbs in your life, including um, almost dying on Mount Rainier in 1992, um, which, as we mentioned, was is running on Animal Planet right now on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Um, but before we get into that. I'd like to let our viewers know a little bit more about you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how long you've been climbing and how you got involved in it? Sure. I've been climbing since about 1981 or 82, uh, so about 29 years now. Okay. And I started out uh, just camping. I went camping with my buddies in high school, and that led to backpacking, and that led to rock climbing, which led to ice climbing, and then finally high-altitude mountaineering around the world. So it was a, a slow progress right up that curve, but it's just like, Expanding my horizons and learning yeah. more skills with time. Absolutely. And, and so prior to 1992 um, on Rainier, what kind of climbs had you been involved in? Uh, before the Rainier trip in 1992, I'd been rock climbing for about 10 years. Okay. So I'd rock climbed around New England, had been out to Yosemite, climbed a lot in Colorado and mm -hmm. Montana. And also I'd been ice climbing, uh, ice climbing around New England again and uh, Montana, mm -hmm. up in uh, Oregon and Washington. And uh, I'd been living in Colorado for about uh, about uh, six years. So I'd been rock and ice climbing about 10 years around the country and had been on expedition as well overseas to uh, Argentina. Very cool. And, and um, you know, so obviously you had the chops to, to tackle mountains. Was Rainier, though, the, your biggest challenge up to that point? I think so. I had been on uh, t maybe harder technical routes on rock or ice for a pitch or two. And I had been to higher altitudes, even as high as... 22,800 feet down in Argentina. Mm -hmm. But the Rainier climb, we, we took a pretty challenging route called the Liberty Ridge. And yeah. it's one of the classic climbs. And so it was uh, three, three and a half days of, of hard uh, snow and ice climbing, yeah. carrying pretty big packs on pretty technical terrain, swinging right. two ice axes and belaying a lot of pitches. So yeah, I would say that was my biggest alpine challenge up to that point. Okay. And then, so let's talk about that, that climb up Liberty Ridge. So you said three and a half days and and what was the weather like? Or, you know, how did it compare to what you thought it would be like? Well, we had actually very stable and warm weather. Uh, okay. My partner, Mike Price, and I climbed on the north side of Rainier. So uh, it was still pretty warm even on the north side where things are usually cooler. Yeah. Uh, it was sunny. Uh, it was very stable weather. So we were worried about the weather because it's a pretty serious route. You don't want to get caught halfway up. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed good at the time for the climb. In fact, though, what was happening was it was record high temperatures in Seattle, record high temperatures on the south side of the mountain, mm. and that was causing the quality of the snow and the snow pack to degrade over those couple of days we were on the north side. So gotcha. while the weather was favorable, that didn't help the strength of the snow on the glacier that we had to descend. Gotcha. Yeah. So you, you get up to the top in three and a half days. How much time did you actually spend on the top before you started heading back down? Oh, probably a half an hour or so after, okay. after climbing for three and a half days. And we were roped together yeah. night and day. We didn't bring a tent, so we bivouacked out in the open with our sleeping bags, mm -hmm. uh, several nights anchored in on ice screws or snow pickets. So when we got to the top and it was flat, we were just so happy to, to unrope and be able to walk around on the summit and yeah. not have to worry about uh, technical terrain. So we were right. up for about a half an hour. Some folks took our pictures, and then we loaded up our packs and started down a, an easier route called the... Uh, Emmons Glacier route on the northeast side of Rainier. Right, and so you, you, I, I believe you said you anticipated that that route would probably be about eight hours, and you'd be back, back in. Yeah, that, that's pretty standard. Maybe three, four hours down the glacier, okay. and another three, four hours, uh, maybe three hours back through the the trail back to the White River uh, campground. Okay, so you're heading back down, and and tell us a, a bit about what happened. Well, everything was going pretty well. The weather was good, and we had summited in the. The route we are going down was far less technical than we'd been on for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And we made it about halfway down the glacier. We were pro probably, well, we were more than halfway down. We are about three quarters of the way down, maybe 45 minutes from being off the glacier. And we entered a section called the Corridor. And it's known for being uh, relatively cross-free because it's kind of a compressed zone on the glacier. Yeah. And uh, we were moving along, following the tracks of other climbers that were on the mountain the days before. And uh, I stepped uh, just two steps off the trail to angle across a little bit to uh, cut over to another section of the trail. And I was probing with my ice axe as we were going, as, as I should have been. Mm -hmm. Roped to my partner, Mike, who was about 50 feet behind me uphill. Right. And I stepped in the snow and took another step, probed on the third step. Uh, the snow just started sinking, collapsing beneath me. 
Right. I and thought I would, was just in a deep spot, but it turns out that was a snow bridge. And it was and just so snow... fast that there was no turning back. Correct. Uh, we had pretty big packs from uh, yeah. rock and ice gear and our camping gear. And so I sunk in up to my knee and I realized what was going on. I yelled falling to my partner, Mike. Right. But by then I was already sinking and sort of falling forward as the snow right. bridge collapsed. And the weight of my pack just drove me forward into the snow. And next thing I know, the bridge was collapsing beneath both feet. And I started slithering right through the snow bridge. Wow, wow. And, uh, you know, you said you were attached to about 50 feet of rope to, to Mike. and Correct. And under, a, under normal circumstances, that is meant so that if you do fall, he can dig in and, and, and save you, essentially. So, so what happened in this circumstance? Well, this, we were at uh, a length on the rope, about 50 feet or so, which is sort of normal for glacier traverse. Mm -hmm. And I had another coil of 50 feet of rope on my chest, and he had another coil of 50 feet of rope on his. Okay. And the rope was pretty much taut. Usually you try and keep, you know, two, three feet of slack between you at the most. And Mike dug in right away. Uh, when I yelled falling, Mike would drop to the ground, I'm sure, and dig in with his ice axe to self-arrest and thus stop me. Mm. But the snow was so soft and wet. It was just about noontime. Yeah. On June 21st, the longest, sunniest day of the year. And uh, I think the snow just was too soft, too wet. Mike dug in, and he'd been a climber for 14 years, mm. an outward bound instructor, been on search and rescue in Antarctica. So wow. he was a real qualified mountaineer, um, and been on ski expedition to Alaska for 30 some odd days. Okay. So he was doing, he dug in, and he did slow me down. Uh, but the problem was that he couldn't stop me because the snow was so wet. And so as I fell and got beat up in the crevasse going down 50 feet, that dragged Mike towards the edge. And eventually he got pulled over the lip of the crevasse and came tumbling in the crevasse with me. Wow. That's just, that's amazing. And, and the, uh, you know, so you're eventually at the bottom and you, you fall onto essentially another snow bridge of sorts within the crevasse. Is that correct? Yes. As, as I tumbled down and then Mike was tumbling down behind me, uh, we fell about a total of 80 feet into the crevasse, mm. and as you go deeper in crevasses, the, the pressure of the ice moves uh, the walls in, and so they get V-shaped, and they get squeezed at the bottom. So okay. at the very, about uh, about halfway down the crevasse, actually, the walls got about two feet apart, and my pack jammed in that narrow constriction. Wow. Uh, you call it, when someone, some person or piece of gear gets squeezed in there, we call it corking, like a cork in a wine bottle. Okay. And my pack corked and stopped me against a small ice slab. And that's what stopped me. And then snow fell in, and then Mike fell in, and then more snow fell in. So we were 80 feet down, but actually not even on the bottom of the crevasse yet. We were about halfway down, wow. wedged in this narrow constriction about two feet across. Wow, wow. So you weren't on anything. You were just wedged in there. And then before <laughs> you know it, before you know it, covered in snow, and, and, and how did you end up getting yeah. out? Well, I, at first I was completely buried, and my, my old avalanche training kicked in. I was mm -hmm. scared out of my mind, of course, but I remembered how to, just before I got buried, I made a small air pocket above my head, so I did have a little breathing room by putting my arms in front of me, and I could feel the oxygen being present, but getting more and more strain to squeeze it out of my air pocket, yeah. and eventually I managed to get one hand out and started digging down, and I cleared my own face off like, like, they, right. like you normally do for other patients and, and victims. And I hear my, my, my friend Mike nearby, and I could tell he was very, very severely injured. He was very bad. And so I could hear him, but I couldn't reach him because I was still buried in snow up to my chin. And I couldn't uh, see him in the, in the dark. And uh, before I could fully get myself out, he had trouble breathing. Uh, I tried to do CPR for him when he stopped breathing. And I was still buried in snow up to my chest at that point. Mm. And uh, very sadly, my good friend Mike passed away before I could even get out of the snow in spite of the CPR that I I could do for him. Right, right. And, and big Mike, essentially, you know, you, he kind of softened your fall, right? But he had the full drop. Is that, is that pretty much how it went? Yeah. So. That's correct. My, my partner, Mike, with all his mountain experience, was able to slow me down. So he slowed me down and eased my fall for the first 50 feet. Right. And then once he got pulled and I dropped free fall the last 30 but sadly Mike was not attached to a okay I got gotcha. you uh, so you're you're now you're you're down there and you realize you're all by yourself and and you know you're looking at 80 feet above you you yeah. know how, how do you even 
prepare yourself mentally for that? What goes through your mind to, to think, I'm going to do this? Well, it was a struggle. I mean, I was scared out of my mind. I was devastated at the loss of my friend and partner. Right. I was injured. I crushed some disc in my neck, and I had numbness on my left side of my body, and I was spitting up blood. And at first, I thought, you know, this is it. There's no way to climb out of this. Mm. I yelled a bit, but there were no other climbers nearby to hear us. And at first, I thought, well, this is it. Uh, it's the end for Mike, and it's the end for me. But I couldn't do that. Uh, I'd been taught as a young boy through my dad's construction company to always do the best you can, even when it looks tough. Mm -hmm. And my partner, Mike, was weighing heavy on my mind. He was always a gun climber, and he always encouraged me to, to do my best no matter what. And I realized that I couldn't just quit just because it seemed impossible hard. I was going to have to try my best. Right. And there was no way to walk out either end of the crevasse, but I realized the only way to get out was to, to climb up that overhanging ice wall 80 feet above my head. So mm -hmm. it took a while to get around to it mentally. But I also credit all the climbing magazines and outdoor adventure books I've read through the years because mm -hmm. some of them had taught me things and inspired me to the, to realize that the human being is capable of so much more and we're very resilient. Yeah. And I thought, well, if other people have gotten through misadventures and survived, maybe there's a remote chance, a, a one in a million chance that I might be able to as well. And yeah. so I started gathering my gear and, and to get ready to make the climb out. I still didn't believe in it yet, but I knew I had to try. So what you, you, you start gathering the gear and, and what did you have at your disposal? Well, uh, we had been climbing for a couple days, so I had a few pieces of rock gear, and I had about uh, uh, six ice screws, uh, uh, kind of like this one, about six to nine inches long. This is an old one that I actually had with us on the climb, Mike and I did back in 92. Wow. And I had my two ice axes and my crampons and boots, so I had the, the basics for climbing. But to climb out safely, I really needed 20 ice screws, and I only had six of these. Oh, wow. And I would have... I like had eight slings, nylon slings to stand in. I didn't have those. Mm. I had never aid climbed before. I had never solo climbed before using a rope. So I had a lot of things to figure out under a lot of pressure. Yeah. But again, I read a lot of climbing magazines and books, and I slowly started putting it together. And I, I tied some knots, and I practiced, and I didn't get it right. I tied again, and eventually I figured out a system. It took me about an hour or so to figure out a method using the ropes and the Prusik slings that I could climb and belay myself at the same time. It was right. pretty complex, but after a while I was able to figure something out and make it work. That's fantastic. So, you know, people that are watching this, uh, climbers, adventurers, what kind of advice would you would you give to them to, um, I don't know if avoid this kind of accident is the right thing, but to advice for uh, maybe to have the right mindset to survive a situation like this? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of mishaps that happen in the mountains to everyone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's difficult to give a particular stew for a particular scenario. So right. I like the way you rephrase the question. Let's think about how did they get through something like us or being stuck below a cliff, getting lost in the woods. I think there are some basic things there. Number one is it's an old Boy Scout adage to be prepared, but by golly, it means something. Um, yeah. Read all you can. Use the best gear. And perhaps most importantly, pick really good partners to go into the wilderness and into the mountains with mm. because uh, your partner best your best thing when things go awry. So uh, be prepared. Yeah. Train as hard as you can. Read a lot of books. Learn a lot of tidbits about the equipment, about different techniques because I, I was pulling mentally from all through the years to give me data to help me figure it out. And if a mishap does occur, is to realize that human beings are incredibly resilient. Yeah. We, are, we have abilities to, to pull pieces of information, glue them together, and create something new to solve a problem that we might not have ever imagined before yeah and that's what got me going got going i realized yes i wanted to get out and survive but i also owed it to my partner mike to do the best i could for him because he had helped me survive the accident and i couldn't bring him back but all i could do was climb out of there and try and let his parents know what happened to him so i drew yeah. strength from the fact that my partner was still counting on me to do the best i could to get our team off, uh, out, of the, out of the crevasse and off the mountain. Yeah. And when things got really tight, I thought about his family, my family, and how much they'd, they'd want to know what happened to us. So I, I reached inside my heart and my brain and pulled out pieces and sources of strength to give me the energy. That's fantastic. And, you know, so jumping back for a second to the, to the actual escape from the crevasse, how long did it, did it take you from the, from the time where you gathered your senses and said, I have to start climbing to the time that you hauled yourself out of the crevasse? It took me about an hour to prepare myself mentally and my equipment. Like okay. 
I mentioned, and I actually had uh, only one ice axe and I needed two. I had to rappel 15 feet deeper into the glass to recover one of the ice axes that had been dropped. So oh. by the time I rigged a system, rappelled down and got that other ice axe even deeper in the crevasse, which was a very scary place. So that took about an hour. And okay. then when, once I started climbing, my climb up the wall was... Uh, so by the time I, I pulled, over, pulled over the lip of the crevasse, it had been about five and a half hours since we'd fallen inside uh, back about noontime, and I got wow. out about 5.30, quarter of six. Yeah, and then you um, you you put a screw in the in the mountain and attached the rope that Mike was attached to, and and uh, t talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we were we were short on uh, on these ice screws, like I said, so I had yeah. to use them very wisely and very carefully. And mm -hmm. what I did was I had to leave one ice screw behind, and I attached Mike's to that because I was worried if our ledge collapsed, he would go deep in the crevasse and we wouldn't be able to recover him. Mm. So I left one ice screw at, at the bottom as our bottom anchor. Mike was attached to that, and I clipped my rope to it with a, with a figure eight on a bite knot so that acted as my bottom anchor. So mm. Mike and I were still attached and bonded through our bottom anchor. And then as I climbed up, I used the other ice screws as intermediate points of protection. Mm. And for most of the climb, I had to use, uh, use techniques for aid climbing, which is you reach up and put a screw in, mm -hmm. hang from it, and advance just a few feet at a time. Right. Because I didn't have enough screws, I had to go up and then down the slope and then back up and down the slope. We call it leapfrogging the gear, to reuse the gear I got higher you. up and to jump it ahead of you. And so, uh, mm. yeah, the gear I used was, was critical along the way. I had just enough to make it work. Right. I had to use pieces of gear in ways that I'd never, I'd never thought of before, using rock climbing gear to, to stand in in my crampons, to leapfrog yeah. the gear, tying, tying knots with pieces of uh, cord that really weren't designed for that kind of knot. Mm. So I had a lot of challenges, but by knowing the gear and knowing some basics, and being motivated to get out, I was able to figure a system out that worked. Yeah, that's awesome. That is a fantastic story. And and for anybody that wants more details on on the the escape from the crevasse itself, I recommend highly watch the uh, the show on Animal Planet because it really goes into depth with some great reenactments as well. It's a fantastic piece. Uh, so after the '92 trip, what what kind of a break did you take from climbing, and and what kind of climbs have you been on recently? I guess. Yeah, the, um, I did take a break course. I was, I was beat up physically and mentally and spiritually. Yeah. And I was a little torn because uh, the mountains had always been sort of my playground and my, my spiritual recovery. Mm -hmm. And it's what I did with my life and my recreation. So at first yeah. I wasn't sure if I, if I wanted to go back or not. It had been such a bad experience for Mike and I. So I took it slow. I went back to my roots. I started doing ca casual hikes near home. Mm -hmm. And if it still felt like fun, I bumped it up a little bit. And then I went to do harder hikes. And then backpacking, and then mm -hmm. a little bit of rock climbing, easy stuff, and then a little bit harder. And my wife and I went on a trek to Nepal, and that uh, kind of put us in the mountains again. And so I slowly eased my way back up the curve of spending more time and doing more difficult things in the mountains, and eventually I found myself rock and ice climbing. And then finally in uh, 1998, I was offered the opportunity to co-lead an expedition to Nepal. Wow. And I started taking uh, college students working for my local university program here, Colorado State University. Yeah, and we took uh, college students over and took them on their first expedition to Nepal, and that just kind of pulled me back into climbing. So now I help teach the occasional class for college students and even uh, children as young as ki uh, kindergarten. I, I volunteer in the local elementary school, and every wow. spring we teach 500 kids how to rock climb in their gymnasium on their artificial wall. No kidding. Yeah, it's it's quite an experience to teach 500 kids from <laughs> uh, kindergarten to sixth grade. Uh, and we uh, how to climb, and we actually encourage the, the fourth through sixth graders, we teach them how to belay. Wow. And through a careful process, we have hundreds of kids belaying hundreds of other kids. So What a school uh, that, that is. That helped me find a place for climbing in my life again is to share it with others. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, yeah. and, so you, uh, and you're still leading expeditions, right? Correct. I still go on an expedition about every other year, okay. and uh, most of them I'm leading uh, college students uh, to places mm -hmm. around the world like Bolivia and Ecuador and Nepal. Oh. And uh, a year and a half ago, I took a personal expedition and went to Tibet and climbed the sixth highest peak in the world, okay. uh, Choi Yu, at uh, 26,900 feet. Wow. And so that was, that was quite a challenge, but we had a good yeah. trip and a good team, and we made the summit. So it's, uh, it's still been very rewarding to me. Very cool. Very cool. So aside from climbing, tell us about some of the other things you've been up to lately. 
Oh, thanks. Well, you, you mentioned the TV show, I Shouldn't yeah. Be Alive. That was a, a real good experience, and it's still yeah. airing on Animal Planet, so people can see that for the weeks and months ahead. Yeah. And I've also spent a lot of time uh, writing. Uh, my partner, uh, my writing partner, Kevin Vaughn, and I have just written a book that's going to come out in July of 2011. Right. And it tells the Rainier story, kind of parallel to the I Shouldn't Be Alive show, but mm -hmm. with lots more. It describes a lot of the technical struggles to climb out of the crevasse and some other climbs I've been on and lessons from it. So that book is called The Ledge. And it'll okay. be published in July through uh, Valentine Books and Random House. And um, I speak a lot. I speak as a professional living uh, to corporate mm -hmm. groups and conferences. So yeah. between uh, some climbing and speaking and writing yeah. and the TV show, I've been I've been busy. But it's all been great, and there's a lot of good stuff going on. That's awesome. Yeah, and I've actually I've watched some of your speaking videos. I know you have some clips on YouTube, and uh, right. really found it to be great stuff. You know about you know translating your experiences and. and in both climbing and, and leadership in general into, you know, helping organizations and, and companies uh, understand how they can overcome fear and, and you know, um, achieve big challenges with limited resources. So I, I think it's a, it's a great story and, and really uh, inspiring stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. It, it is, you know, it's, it's not so much teaching the, the meetings and the corporate groups how to climb or hike or anything. It's pulling the lessons from it, as you said, yeah. and distilling those lessons down. And they're, they're human lessons about perseverance, resilience, mm -hmm. uh, being brave in the face of adversity and challenge. And I share those lessons uh, with groups, and uh, I get a lot of positive feedback. So I hope somehow it helps them face the challenges that they have in business and in life. Yeah, well, it's fantastic stuff. And, and Jim, thanks again very much for coming on the show. Um, for people that, that want to know more about you, I guess we can uh, have them go to your website, which is speakingofadventure.com, right? That's correct. And uh, the Animal Planet uh, special, I Shouldn't Be Alive, will be airing again January 19th and 20th. So correct. people can check that out and obviously look for your book coming in a few months called The Ledge. Correct. Anything else? you got a lot going on. We got a lot going on. I'm just hoping that folks will read it, uh, enjoy a good adventure tale, and get some inspiration and uh, use it to be resilient and strong in their own life and their own challenges. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Jim. And uh, as always, this is Camping Gear TV. I'm Josh. This is Jim. And we'll see you next time. Take care.